Hi, folks, and thank you for joining us for this evening's discussion and movie screening of The Ants and the Grasshopper. My name is Gail Angelato, and I am a professor of horticulture at Oregon State University, uh, where I also manage the Master Gardener program for OSU. I'm really pleased to have with me this evening Dr. Vivek Shandis. Um, Dr. Shandis, if you could turn your camera on. Thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm just going to let folks know a little bit about you and your expertise. Uh, Dr. Shandis is a professor in the College of Urban and Public Affairs at Portland State University. His work focuses on developing strategies for addressing the implications of climate change on cities. His teaching and research examine the intersection of exposure to climate-induced events, governance and processes, and planning mechanisms. As the founder and director of the Sustaining Urban Places Research Lab at PSU, he brings a policy-relevant approach to research, including the evaluation of environmental stressors on human health, developing of indicators and tools to improve decision-making, and the construction of frameworks to guide the growth of urban regions. Uh, over the past few years, research from his lab has appeared in multiple media outlets, including NPR, The Washington Post, The New York Times, Minnesota Public Broadcasting, Smithsonian Magazine, as well as other national and international media. And I'm really pleased, Dr. Shandis, that you could join us tonight for um, the discussion of this film. Thank you for um, spending uh, a Monday evening, a holiday evening with us. Absolutely. What better day to be talking about things that are global, things that are about uh, the interconnectedness among us. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you, Gail. And wonderful screening, wonderful film. I hadn't seen it before, so I'm really grateful to have the chance to facilitate a conversation. Yeah, I hadn't seen it before either, but when I was searching for things that the Master Gardener program could do to celebrate OSU's Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service, um, I like movies and I like movie discussions, and this one seemed really interesting, and it certainly lived up to the promise of the trailer. I was wondering if... Um, the movie focused on climate change. Uh, the movie focused on um, vulnerable communities to climate change, as well as some important gender issues and, and how that plays out in agriculture, um, as well as vulnerability to climate change. But it never really defined climate change. I'm wondering if you um, were to talk to someone uh, who had heard about climate change a lot in the media, um, but hadn't really given it deep thought about what climate change actually is. How would you explain climate change to someone else? Um, yeah, it's a really important um, question of communication that I think about when I think about describing climate change. I talk to my family in different, um, I, I'll just start by at least giving a little background of myself because the way I describe things will be biased by the experiences I've had and the training I've uh, had the privilege of receiving, the, encount the encounters, the, the science I pay attention to. And so all of those things kind of come together to give um, this perspective that I'll, I'll share today. Um, and I'll try to intersperse some of my own personal um, ideas into this, in part because I think this story is so much about the combination of the personal kind of change narrative combined with kind of a planetary system that's kind of really in a, in a transitional state right now, um, to put it mildly. Um, climate change in general is just the idea that we have a set, we have a planet that has some gases that encompass the atmosphere and those gases have been maintaining the temperature for the last about 30 um about i'd say 8000 years at a very stable level so that we can grow agriculture we can actually create settlements though what's happened in the last 150 years is we've through the uh, creation of fossil um combustion fossil fuel combustion we've been emitting a lot of gases that have added to what is already out there. So these are carbon dioxide, this is methane, nitrogen oxides, et cetera, several gases through this process of combustion that then add to this 
layer that's surrounding the planet that actually then insulates the temp insulates the heat that's coming in from the sun. And so each day as you wake up, this incredible um, um, energy, short wave radiation, as the scientists call it, come through the atmosphere and hit the ground. It's absorbed by the ground. It's absorbed by the ocean. It, and some of it bounces back from the clouds. Some of it bounces back from the ocean and the land. And a lot of that, a lot of those gases that we've been emitting over the, hundred, the last 150 years have been holding much of that heat on the planet. And so what we have is an overall increase in the temperature of the planet. And you might hear things about keeping things below two degrees Celsius or keeping it below one degree Celsius. That's all associated to this idea of climate change. And it's not a new phenomenon. We've known about climate change for over a hundred years scientifically in the modern conventional science, in the sense that a Swedish, uh, a Swedish scientist back in 1902 actually published a paper um, looking at coal and the relationship to um, climate change. And Ar Arginus, if I have the Swedish pronunciation right, is that scientist, Svete Arginus. And it, it, was, it was a really compelling document that then in the 1960s was actually confirmed by none other than fossil fuel researchers, which is a super interesting irony in this whole climate change discussion as well. So in, in general, um, I, it's, it's the blanket around the earth, the heat being trapped in and not be, having a chance to actually um, be regulated as it has for millennia. Thank you so much for that explanation. Um, there was a comment in the chat that I was wondering if you could address about whether or not climate is also dependent upon the sun and the sun um, being unstable over years. Um, so I'll read the I'll read the the comment. Uh, climate is also dependent on the sun, and it hasn't been stable for thousands of years. We've had the little ice age and all of those things. Um, do you have uh, a, a clarification that you might be able to add for uh, someone who who um, has a question about the role that uh, instabilities in the sun might have on climate change and the fact that in the recent, well, geologically recent past, there have been um, smaller ice ages through time? Yeah, I mean, we are on a planet that responds to the energies that it receives from the local sun it has, uh, the sun that's adjacent to it and that gives us all of the vegetables and crops and um, energy that we have, essentially. And so the sun in and of itself is, is going to be emitting huge amounts of energy. The extent to which that energy varies is going, it, the, the energy that varies is going to change from time to time though the total amount of energy we can calculate pretty carefully at this point. We've been able to get a lot of the climate models to really ground the um, science within a, within a order of magnitude of uh, accuracy that allows us to really predict how much energy we are able to pick up on. The details of the instability of the sun is something that's probably a physical scientist like our Swedish friend who uh, really made the first claim of climate change, uh, Svante could probably speak to in a lot more detail. There's a lot of photochemistry that happens with the sun hitting the earth. Um, there's a lot of uh, the reflectivity, the amount of clouds in the sky also affects the amount of heat we're getting. Um, so there are many factors that go into that. These, these uh, climate models have been developed over the last 30 years have become increasingly precise. That said, that many of them broke as a result of the heat dome that we saw this last summer in the Pacific Northwest. And so we're still constantly refining these models is about where I could go with that question. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shandis. For folks that are typing in questions in the chat, I want to let you know that I am trying to keep track of your questions. We have Dr. Shandis until 8 p.m. this evening, so we have time for about a 45-minute discussion. There were several other points that I want to make sure that I get to, so if I don't get to your question, I apologize. I'm both trying to keep track of them on the side as well as um, manage some of the other questions that I wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to talk about. Uh, Dr. Shandis, you mentioned the heat dome that we had this past summer. Um, <laughs> It was any Oregon gardener who um, 
who was here during the heat dome. Uh, probably we don't need to remind them what that was. Uh, but I know that the heat dome and climate change in cities, it is directly aligned with your own research. And one of the questions that I saw come through chat was somebody who wanted to know about the effects of the paved environment in urban areas, so cement and roads, um, uh, what effect that may have on climate change. So could you tell us a little bit more about that line of your own research and specifically, part of the reason that we chose this movie for today, the Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service at OSU, is because climate change is an area of scientific inquiry, but it's also something that can be thought of as an environmental justice, social justice issue. And I think that your research um, touches on that quite well. So could you tell us a little bit more about your research in general and uh, specifically what you did during last year's heat dome? Sure, sure. Thanks, Gail. I'd be happy. And I can go by Vivek too. I'm, I'm fine with that. Um, um, if you're okay with Gail as well. Um, I, I, um, just, just the connection to the movie was just stark because the inequities that showed up in the movie were so, um, obvious in the way that the Raj Patel, who's the, uh, director of the movie kind of brought it together. The difference not only in the globe, between the global south, the global north, um, also the differences in the way, um, when Anita travels to the U.S. and sees how these disparities are playing out and the comments around how certain communities are um, are houseless in cities when they're going through that scene in Oakland. And then to kind of juxtapose that with, hey, that looks, those people who are living outside look a lot like me. And making those personal connections was very powerful for me um, to, to witness uh, through this movie. And not surprising in many ways, because the work we've been trying to do is um, with climate change, one of the hardest things, and I think it was a theme in the movie, is personalizing it. And this is where the idea of using simple temperature measurements such that we've been doing as kids uh, when we want to, when our uh, family is, or our caretakers are thinking about a fever that we may have. And so we're using temperatures to kind of gauge how well our body is doing. And so um, about a decade ago or so, a few of us got together and started measuring temperatures around cities with some in research grade thermometers and wanted to get a sense for how those temperatures vary across the country and what I, I, I'm sorry, across the city. And we did this all around the country. We've now done this in over 50 cities, um, small um, cities, as well as very large ones like New York City, all the way down um, to tiny little places in Virginia, for example, like we did last summer. Um, and what we we're finding is these really large differences in one part of the city to another in terms of temperature. And it, we, were, we work with community-based organizations to do this work and to go out and collect 100,000 different measurements at the same time in the morning, afternoon, and evening. So we get what we call that diurnal profile of temperatures in the city. And we, um, we've done this and usually found about a 15 to 20 degree Fahrenheit difference between one part of a city and another. And what we came to see over and over and over of doing this is that the communities that were in the hottest places during a heat wave where temperatures were often 15 to 20 degrees Fahrenheit hotter than another part of the city, were also those places where lower income as well as communities of color were often living. And so we were scratching our heads saying, you know, how is that possible? Um, so consistently across the country, what's going on? Is the heat, um, it, what's happening with the heat? Is it related to the tree canopy? Is it related to the materials on the ground? And, and so about a couple of years ago, we conducted a study looking at 108 cities around the country and essentially comparing their temperatures with a policy that the federal government had codified in the 1930s called redlining, which was a segregation policy that put lower income immigrant communities of color essentially in one, neighbor, in one set of neighborhoods in the city that were marked by a red line. Another set, they were called hazardous neighborhoods from a mortgage investment perspective. That's who really, that's, this was really driven through. And then there were another set of uh, four different sets of neighborhoods. One was red lined, one was yellow lined, one was uh, green, blue lined, and one was green lined. And we found about um, a five degree Fahrenheit difference between the red line neighborhoods and the green line neighborhoods for, um, for essentially all, almost all of the cities that we 
94% of the cities that we looked at of the 108 set um, had that temperature difference. Some of them were really high. I was surprised to see that Portland, Oregon had a 13 degree um, Fahrenheit difference between a red line neighborhood and a green lined one. And so it really gave us a little bit of insight into the fact that climate change is not kind of falling on every community in the same way. Those that have greater coping capacity with air conditioner, like what Anita was saying in the movie, I found really, um, I really took to heart is that the communities that are facing some of the hardest effects in, in globally are, um, we can also see that reflected here in the Pacific Northwest or anywhere in, in the country that we studied that this difference of heat as a heat wave comes through, one person sitting in a home might be experiencing 120 degrees in their apartment, while another person may be experiencing a 70 degree uh, day in their apartment. So what we're seeing is 50 degrees of Fahrenheit difference between one um, person and another within their own residence. And that to us has really ushered in an era of understanding how big temperature differences can be in a city. And this last summer in the heat dome event, we went out and collected temperatures around the city of Portland, and, uh, Oregon, and found that one neighborhood was 124 degrees, that was in Southeast Lentz neighborhood, whereas a Northwest neighborhood in um, Portland was 99 degrees on a 115 degree day that the airport would call. And so that wow. 25 degree difference suddenly raised my eyebrows in terms of the idea of as temperatures heat up, we're also seeing a greater difference in the uh, ambient temperature, which could translate to um, a greater impact on communities as we see the temperature dial uh, move up. And as you know, the numbers are in now. 2021 was the sixth hottest year um, on record in the U.S., I think is what NOAA is attributing um, to. And a lot of the heat and the heat dome was unequivocally uh, associated to uh, climate change as well. And so we can get into that weather and climate thing if if it um, if it's relevant. Thanks, Vivek. I just want to pull on a couple of threads that um, are just astounding to me. So, what you're saying, if I could just reiterate, is that in the same city there are drastic differences in temperature. And part of it is because of differences in access to coping mechanisms, such as access to air conditioning. But the part that really blows me away about your research, and correct me if I'm thinking about this the wrong way, um, but you and your research group have shown that historical redlining um, of neighborhoods by the U.S. government back in the 1940s, 80 years ago, that decisions to redline neighborhoods 80 years ago are showing a temperature signature today. So 80 years later, we're still seeing the legacy of those redlining decisions in the form of drastic differences in heat and really vulnerability of the residents in those communities to these extreme heat events. Yes, thank you, Gail. That's uh, really a uh, uh, a synthesis, a little capture of exactly what we're showing. We're not saying it's causation per se. We're finding a very clear correlation in this work. And the interesting part is as somebody who studies uh, urban regions, the thing that I've come to understand is in the 50s, when we were real, when the U.S. was really excited about in infrastructure, as we are again now, the infrastructure was going into neighborhoods that were often the lowest cost, uh, land cost neighborhoods. And those lowest land cost neighborhoods were by design lowest land cost because the red line neighborhoods were disinvested in by local municipalities for decades already. And those uh, by disinvesting in a neighborhood, meaning you're not bringing any services to that neighborhood, you're not bringing any green spaces, any parks, any gardens to that neighborhood, you're really uh, leaving that neighborhood on its own. Those specific freeways and infrastructure, housing projects, industries, all went to those land hungry developments all went to, um, all went right into those specific uh, neighborhoods that were redlined. And so um, again, redlining is a, uh, just a process by which specific neighborhoods were identified as very risky for home loan mortgages coming out of the Great Depression in 1929 
It started around 1933, um, and it really kind of precipitated a um, set of segregation policies that were legally um, that were legally binding. And if a, for example, if a black family um, moved into a Green Line neighborhood, that black family could be sued for doing so. And the specific neighborhood covenants would say that you know no Negro, Chinese, Japanese, or other um, international immigrants shall live in this neighborhood. And so there were these neighborhood covenants that were set up legally backed by local authorities. And we're seeing that 80 years later, just as you're saying, Gail, that that signature of that segregation policy is off, is what we're finding to also affect the communities today. And so part of that reason, which you alluded to was because those dis, those red line neighborhoods, which were subject to disinvestment or lack of investment, that they were more prone to development. So they are the more paved, less green areas of a city today. That's, ex- then, that's exactly right. And then once that, I don't know that you'll have the answer to this, um, but once those areas are paved, is there any opportunity to, to depave and to invest in green infrastructure? Um, are there are there policies which would promote the re-greening of these historically uh, neglected neighborhoods? Yeah, um, it, it's a tricky, I'll just say it's a tricky question in part because when we see a problem like this neighborhood doesn't have garden space, it doesn't have green space, uh, parks, it doesn't have trees, street trees. And so let's just create a city policy to put a bunch of trees into this neighborhood on all the streets. Let's get lots of green spaces um, uh, developed. And there's, a, I've seen this actually as a kind of almost a knee jerk response to the research that we, we put together. And so that's where you start seeing concerns over uh, communities, seeing that the city is again, doing something to them as opposed to engaging them in the conversation about what would be helpful in this particular neighborhood and trying to what we often call co-produce the solutions together. And that's something that um, we are really trying to get a better um, understanding around is how do we actually work with communities together to identify what might be strategies for the challenges they're facing, including heat or flooding or other climate induced hazards that are increasingly becoming more um, personally uh, um, observable or personally ex- experienced by the communities there. And so, yes, There are policies that are moving that are, for example, saying greening in low income, low canopy neighborhoods is a priority, though to do that, um, to do that thoughtfully and to do that together with the community is something that we're really trying to encourage policymakers to think a lot more carefully around. Thank you for that. I want to get back to the movie uh, for a moment again. And some of the some of the notes that I took during the movie was um, climate change disproportionately affecting people of color. Um, Anita at one point says that if we talk about climate change, maybe we can save more lives. And uh, this goes to a comment I saw from Marissa, who noted um, the number of people who died in Uh, recent extreme heat events. I think Marissa um, might have been in British Columbia or Ottawa, somewhere in Canada. Um, People died in in Oregon's heat dome event as well. And it was largely based upon where they were living and residing at the moment of the of the heat dome. Um, I guess the question that I am long windedly getting to is that it really struck me that when Anita was asked by the first set of family farmers what they can do to help her, she said, talk about climate change. And then two different set of farmers said, oh yeah, we never talk about climate change. The first, the first family said, we just assumed that they knew about it. And then the second family um, didn't talk about it at all. I'm wondering, as a scientist who studies climate change, do you talk about climate change with your friends and your family? And 
I am an entomologist by training, and I have to say, I don't talk about climate change as, re as a regular practice or even a rare practice with my friends or family. So I'm just wondering, do you have those conversations and how do you broach those conversations? How do you normalize uh, discussions about climate change? Yeah, it's, I, I'm, I feel very, um, I feel very lucky in many ways that um, family members, uh, um, that my family is open to conversations about climate change. Um, though, um, for uh, for example, I went to India to visit my uh, uh, family in South India. They're about eight degrees above the equator, and I visit them, you know, as often as I can. A lot more before the pandemic. Um, and when I would visit, they recently in the last since about 2012 or so, they would say to me. Um, and if you know South Asians, you know their love for mangoes. So the cycle of mangoes is a very important thing in many parts of South Asia. And so they're telling me that the mangoes were ripening in January and they always ripen in March. And they were open to that conversation and they wanted to kind of think about what that might mean and whether it's going to become December or November or what, what that pattern or shift is actually means. And so what I've come to really um, connect with climate change was a theme in the movie, this notion of until it personally impacts me, I'm not really going to be paying attention to it. And so Anita's struggle to go out and have that conversation with farmers throughout the U.S. was a rec in some ways I was interpreting that as a recognition of how her own story was about the personal impact that she had. And she wanted to find out whether a place in the United States that was um, arguably one of the most important contributors to the greenhouse gas gases in the world had concerns, had the same personal impacts as she did. And so what I like to do is really kind of ground the conversation in the lived experience. You know, we can show data and we can, I, I can show data. I can talk about the data. I can go out and collect lots of it though until I can really connect with people on what their experience was like during a weather, during an extreme weather event, it's really hard to have that conversation. And for me, temperature has been a really easy one. I have to say, I've tried flooding, I've tried landslides, I've tried sea level rise. They've been very challenging conversations. Temperature is something I feel like I've really found a sweet spot for conversations in part because I can, I can say hot enough for you, you know, and have a much more of a casual conversation about what it means um, and whether there are certain patterns people are noticing in terms of temperature in their own lives and the clothing they wear, let alone the, the kind of fashion trends and on top of that to make it real for them in terms of the foods they eat and, and, and the kind of quality of, of, um, of outdoor time that they have. So for me, it's really about that lived experience and how to connect to that among the people I talk to. I think that's really good advice. I, uh, keeping one eye on the chat um, kind of makes me think that sometimes I think people may avoid discussions of climate change because they're worried about it getting political and we don't know how to navigate necessarily those contentious discussions. Um, but making it personal, connecting it to someone's lived experience. That was even a quote from the movie uh, from the Jackson family farm family who ended up selling their farm. But at one point, it, uh, the note was, it wasn't until we had that personal experience that we realized we needed to change. And they weren't talking about climate change specifically, but I think until it really hits home, um, but do we have to wait for it to hit home for everyone? And by that point, will it be... Um, a tipping point that will be hard to recover from. Mm. And in that time, going back to the idea that um, climate change disproportionately affects vulnerable communities, communities that have less power. I really love that um, line that Anita shared that when elephants fight, the grass always gets trampled. How can we protect those who are most vulnerable or advocate for those who are most vulnerable um, during this time when we're still yeah. trying to get everyone on board to recognize that there's an issue and action is needed. 
Yeah, it's it's a yeah, so many so many threads there that are interesting to think about. I mean, one thing I would just encourage the uh, audience to think about or maybe reflect on a little bit is, you know, I can um, I, I had the privilege of working in the Middle East for a little while where there where I actually saw in um, 120 degree direct sunlight where the clouds rarely show up. Um, um, constructing glass towers in the desert where the sun goes right through the glass and the inside is cooled to a 65 Fahrenheit and kept there throughout the day and night. And the amount of energy resources that humans are able to pool and throw into the construction of buildings and the cooling of buildings and the, um, and, and the way in which energy resources have been used, I think is something I've been reflecting on um, for a long time. And this notion of um, you know, live simply so you can simply live at the end. S really interesting to me because um, including when I have my family members from India come and visit the U.S., they immediately talk about how um, people, Americans have everything yet have so take so much for granted. And it's something I've been trying to reconcile in my own life for so long and trying to make sense of. But to get it, your, I think another thread that you had was we can all make decisions about ourselves because we may have access to resources and have a level of privilege to protect ourselves during a heat wave and cool our homes and keep our families safe. Though all it takes is a simple walk out to, for me, out a couple of blocks to see folks living in tents at, as what I've measured, 130 lethal 135 degrees Fahrenheit living in tents in direct sunlight. And so where we see um, this kind of reality playing out right in front of us, I, I wonder if we would ask ourselves, you know, am I just looking out for me and my own or am I looking out for my brothers and sisters who are directly um, experiencing things and have very limited coping um, resources to be able to actually uh, navigate what the uh, planet is now bringing to us in, in, in full force. And so part of what I think folks uh, that I talk to or constantly trying to do is how do we create the policies that are trying to lift up those voices and lift up those communities that are the hit first and worst. And that's really what I'd, I'd encourage your, um, encourage the participants to really think about. Do we have a um, ability to, and a heart really, to be able to think about and feel the, the, the struggle and the challenges that um, folks who might not be able to keep themselves cool or dry um, would be facing. And I guess that just comes down to a basic human question. Thanks, Vivek. I think that's really good advice. Within the Master Gardener program, um, Master Gardeners are by definition volunteers. We volunteer in our communities to support sustainable gardening and really to support every Oregonian's um, every Oregonian who wants to garden. Um, we want to be there to help. And within the last two years in particular, we've had a lot of difficult discussions about what it is that we need to do or compelled to do to build an organization which is anti-racist and which really focuses on um, equity, inclusivity, and accessibility of our programs, looking at where we're currently working and where we're not, and asking why and really thinking about um, not just showing up and saying, we're here, we're ready to do the work, but recognizing that it is important to work in partnership with communities uh, to find out exactly what you said, what it is that they um, want and need as a solution. I'm wondering, I don't know where you are in that work, um, if the discussions are to a point, are they to a point where um, community-based solutions have emerged and you're able to uh, to share some common themes about what communities are saying here is what we would like done um, specifically with this issue of urban heat and vulnerability to urban heat in the wake of climate change and extreme weather events? Yeah, um, I, I, that that is, I mean, each one of these questions, I would love, we would, I would love to have like a whole seminar about um in part because there's just so rich and there's so much going on with with some of this the quick uh, one one thing i'm paying a lot of attention to is how is it are strategies that are shifting not only the the question of inclusivity um in conversations of bringing 
um, folks who are off, who have historically not participated in conversations about climate or conversations about neighborhood neighborhoods or uh, conversations about decision making. Um, and that piece is one. The other is the shifting of uh, of power that I'm noticing happening in different places in different ways. And one immediate one in the Portland backyard is the Portland Clean Energy Fund (PCEF), which has been which is I point to as a national model for being able to use the existing legal structures that we have to move resources from a from large multinational corporations that operate in the city and taking a portion, a very small portion of their uh, funds and putting those into a um, into a fund that then provides uh, green infrastructure, provides uh, weatherization, provides a lot of climate related preparedness actions that happen at the individual household and neighborhood level. And those are uh, those funds can only go to 501c3 organizations, which are um, at least legally uh, tax structure wise, community uh, uh, based organizations as one definition of them. And the idea that the that community based organizations are having access to 50 to 60 million dollars a year in one mid sized city in the Northwest to be able to uh, implement these projects that can reduce the impacts of a war of heat um, that can bring, uh, for example, things like solar power, community solar into a neighborhood that would then be linked to um, ductless heat pumps, m um, mini splits that would allow cool air in the summer and warm air in the winter to operate. There's lots of places um, that I think are starting to look to this PCEF program. Denver just passed, I think it was uh, measure 15, 13 or 15, I forget off the top of my head, the um, a measure that essentially does very similar thing to what PCEF is doing. And many elements of the Green New Deal that we saw in the movie were also had layers of what PCEF had has been really trying to do. So there are places of hope. There are places of, of, of structural uh, opening to be able to move resources, to have that inclusivity conversation, though, to also move resources to places that have historically not had them and to be able to build more coping capacity as we see temperatures increase and um, and 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 water and, and precipitation really become a lot more intense as well. Thanks, Vivek. I think that's a really important point that inclusivity is only one small um, narrow part of the overall solution and not just saying like, welcome, we're ready for you, but really making sure that there is a deliberate um, and <laughs> intentional um, transfer of resources and power to communities that are um, disproportionately affected and allowing them to, allowing them, see even saying that, and um, supporting their efforts to make decisions uh, for their own future and communities. Yeah, yeah, That's, yeah, right. Right. Well, um, I, I would just may, maybe I'll just quick comment on that. Um, please. Just the idea I loved in the movie, the, the juxtaposition of how um, a, a, a member, a male member of the village was commenting early on that they would never he would never, you know, see himself pounding the soy or going to cook or things like things that were for women. And the idea that uh, by the end of the movie, he was actively engaging in this and in fact looked like he was actually getting other boys to participate in those activities. Whereas the the next scene was uh, the family that Anita and, and friends had gone out to see who were saying, wait, you're asking us to change the way we grow our food, to change the way we prepare our food. That just doesn't seem right. I don't think we can do that. And the notion of being able to change our ways and the role that humility and the role that kind of um, um, kind of community plays in in being able to get us to move into a more responsible way of caring for the planet, I think is a really interesting theme that I'm I'm kind of honing in on and the idea that um, we can be a lot more um, we our, our institutions and our policies can be a, can can really learn a lot from the way that communities around the world are responding to to climate change as well. Yes. 
You know, before I came to Oregon State, I, um, in another life, I uh, cooperated and collaborated with the Equator Initiative, which is this United Nations Development Program office. And we went to a conference. We went to um, the Conference of Parties. It was COP8, um, where the globe's nations gathered to talk about protecting biodiversity. And something that really struck me was that there were Fijian chiefs, so uh, chiefs called Ratus from um, the island nation of Fiji, and they were talking about how they realized that their annual festival celebrating the success of um, fishing was having negative effects on sustain on on having a sustainable fishery, and that if they just shifted this annual festival, which was akin to like um, you know the biggest holiday in the nation, if they shifted it, it would have a big positive effect on protecting fisheries. And the chief just said, okay, basically the chief was like, okay, we're moving Christmas. We're moving Christmas by three months because it's going to have this positive effect on our fisheries overall. Um, and it was just done. And it was a huge cultural change for sustainability. And that type of change we need major change if we're going to pass a planet which is um, a healthy planet to live on to our children and our grandchildren. And recalcitrance to change continued recalcitrance to change is just kicking the can further down the road. Um, so thank you for that. We have five minutes left. Um, in the last five minutes, I know I've asked you for many tall orders um, tonight, but uh, I'm such a huge fan of your work and you absolutely um, have such wisdom to share with all of us. I want to hone in on something that Lorna um, in the chat mentioned and something that I saw a couple of times in the movie. And it's this feeling of, of being overwhelmed that the, the problem is such a big issue and there are um, policy solutions, there um, are local solutions, there may be individual actions we can take. But sometimes when thinking about the issue of climate change, it can be so overwhelming that it's hard to know where to start. If you were to give this audience, which by and large consists of a lot of folks who volunteer their time in their community, a lot of folks who are passionate about gardening and sustainable gardening, growing local food, um, having uh, green neighborhoods. If you were to give this group some advice for where to start or how not to feel overwhelmed, do you have any parting words of wisdom for us? Oh, boy. Not, I imagine that you had this conversation before because what I have to offer is probably pretty um, mundane in that it's it's what I loved about Anita is it's it's having that conversation and through the conversation often comes the ability not only to recognize where you're challenged with where one is challenged with some of these um, some of these consternations that we're seeing play out right in front of us um, though the idea that you know through conversation we can identify small actions locally that can really start to build momentum. And so as we're having this real challenge and fight with democracy right now in the US and we're seeing a couple of people uh, who can stop entire um, Build Back Better bills, for example, and can really get in the way of potentially promising work that can happen and we're struggling with this, the idea of movements and the idea of creating movements is something I'm starting to spend a lot more time thinking about. And by movements, I'm really talking about the idea that through these conversations, we can actually identify actions that will bring communities together and start to actually identify the changes that are needed. In fact, I don't know of many other ways in which a, a democratic system has had significant change happen outside of these types of movements that have um, that have really sprung up. And so that that's something that I am paying a lot more attention to these days and really trying to take my research into places where I see real um, 
re, uh, real meaningful change that can uh, that can be done through collectives of people committed and coming together, volunteering their time, wanting to see um, uh, wanting to see systems change in ways that could actually allow our planet and our communities to live in in healthy, sustainable ways. And this notion of kind of building movements together and identifying what is it that you really feel, what is it that we really feel passionate about, and how is it that I can contribute to those to that in a um, in a way? I do that through trees. Like that's my that's my thing. Um, I'm a big fan of large, what I like to call charismatic megaflora in cities, and it they're challenging. People say they're going to fall on me and kill me, and I get all of it. I chair the Urban Forestry Commission for the city of Portland, and I've heard it all from every end of the spectrum. And one of the things that I've really been trying to contribute to is a movement around how do we maintain, support, um, uh, enable trees to coexist with humans in cities so that we can kind of reduce the temperature as we get more of these heat waves, absorb that rain as it falls, and really grow those ecosystem services around um, not just Portland, but around all the cities um, that can really inhabit trees. Thank you, Vivek. Um, great parting words. I want to thank you for being here this evening and let you know that I want to join your movement. And I already had one success. My mother, um, who uh, normally does not recognize me as being an expert in anything. So usually whenever I tell her something, she'll she'll double down and question it. She is one of those folks that hates trees. When my sister got married, she gave her a gift of an arborist to cut down um, what <laughs> was likely a century old oak in her front yard. Anyway, I was able to talk my mom as an arborist was going down the road, cutting down trees, which were hazard trees. I was able to talk my mom through um, letting the tree stay in her own front yard and talking about the benefits. So, um, yes, let's talk about trees. Let's protect trees. Uh, look for opportunities to get involved in local tree boards and commissions to protect the great resources that we have in our cities and suburbs. Thank you for that. One mom at a time. One yes. mom at a time. She's my toughest, crit toughest critic. So if I can convince her, that's when I know I'm on the right track. So Sorry. anyway, thank you, folks. Thank you, everyone who joined us for the movie, who stayed for the discussion. Um, a recording of the discussion will be posted on our Master Gardener News blog in a couple of days when it's ready. And with that, I hope you all have a great rest of um, your day, Martin Luther King Jr. Day of Service and Reflection, thinking about what we all can do individually and collectively uh, to promote social and environmental justice where we live and beyond. Thank you. Yeah.